You're listening to WRFU LP. What's up, y'all? This is your boy, DJ BJ Clark, with the After Work Drive show, right here on 104.5 WRFU. I want to invite you to tune in every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 p.m. for the After Work Drive show with your boy, DJ BJ Clark. I'll see you in the future. In the future. In the future. 104.5 WRFU. You are listening to People's History Hour with Grant Neal and Nick Goodell here on WRFU 104.5, Radio Free Urbana. Mm -hmm. This is a disclaimer at the beginning of People's History Hour that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana-Champaign community. The views that we express here are those of us, the speakers, and are not intended to represent WRFU, the IMC, or the Urbana Socialist Forum. Yep, so if you guys hate everything that Grant and I are about to tell you, uh, bring it up with Grant and I on our Facebook page, People's History Hour with Grant Neal and Nick Goodell. Uh, shoot us a message, comment on the page. Uh, you can also, on the page, if you ever have questions about the source work that we use for our shows, you can ask us about that. Um, but yeah, if you have anything to say about us, uh, do it to the Facebook page, not to the wonderful people of the Urbana Socialist Forum. They just give us a nice platform to tell us all, for us to tell you guys all the fun stories we have for you. Um, and boy, do we have a story for you tonight. Uh, so... Right now, Donald Trump is trying to make the U.S. seem like a really big man country. You know, we want to be the top of the pack with nuclear weapons, he just said. Uh, But to the rest of the world, the U.S. has already been the biggest bully of them all. Historically speaking, we've been one of the biggest bullies that human history has ever known. And there's a lot of uh, big uh, examples that a lot of us can probably think of. We can think of our land grab from Mexico in the 1800s. We can think about uh, basically putting Cuba under our control for six decades as a neocolonial territory. The Philippines. Vietnam. But uh, we're here to talk about a country that pretty much never gets attention in uh, its American intervention, and that country is the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada. Now, uh, those of you who are old enough probably remember the 1983 that the U.S. invaded Grenada. Um, so we're here to talk about the background of what led up to that American invasion, or Operation Urgent Fury, yeah. as it was named by the Reagan administration. Now, Grenada is a small country. Um, it's got about hundred, just over 100,000 people living in it today. At the time of the invasion, it was only about 90,000 people living in there. And uh, it's only about 128 square miles. It's one-eighth the yeah. size of Champaign County, Illinois. Mm-hmm. It's a very small country. And this is just the main island, right? There are a few smaller islands. Too yeah, the main island, the Grenada, and there's a few smaller satellite islands uh, to the north of it as well. But yeah. altogether, 128 square miles, that's, uh, that's really small. Yeah, yeah. very small. Um, and Grenada then was... Uh, for a long time, a colony of the French and the British. It has a long history before that. Um, unfortunately, we can't go into that too much right now. Uh, but uh, it was a colony of the French and the British from 1649 to 1783. It was a French colony. Um, and then it was a British colony from 1783 to 1974. Uh, so for all that time, it was officially a colony on paper, but it's been kind of a unfortunately bullied continuously since it officially got its paper freedom in 1974. Uh, But in 1649, uh, it was discovered by Columbus, by the way. He spotted it in, I believe, 1491 from afar, the island, um, on one of his voyages to the, quote, new world that he, quote, discovered. Uh, But anyway, Columbus discovered it, quote. um, But it it took a long time for colonization to happen, and it happened around 1649 when the French started to send... Uh, lots of their own people there to exploit it and whatnot. Um, and it took a long time, actually, a few years, that resistance against the, against French invaders lasted. Uh, but eventually the French essentially slaughtered all the resistance fighters, um, and the remainder either were subjugated and kind of surrendered or fled to neighboring islands. So the French made it a colony. Um, and it was a French colony until... Uh, the Treaty of Versailles in 1783, uh, which ceded it to the British, um, But a few years later, there was a revolt against British rule um, led by Julien Fédon, which was kind of a pro-French revolt, but pro-French in the sense that it was pro-French First Republic, uh, pro-French and that it was pro for human rights. Uh, It was a slave revolt, actually, and 
Uh, Julian Fadon led a revolt of 14,000 out of the 28,000 slaves on the island. So about half the slaves rose up against the British there. Um, and it was kind of a, for a long time, a successful British or a successful guerrilla campaign against the British. Uh, there were many successful battles fought. They even at one point kidnapped and I believe executed the governor general of the island who was appointed by uh, the king. Um, but they kind of the revolt kind of fizzled out when they tried to launch an attack on St. George's Parish, which later became just St. George. But that's the capital of the main island in Grenada. Uh, and the attack failed. Uh, and then the British kind of singled them out and surrounded them on this mountainside. And uh, the, the, they, they had to surrender. And those who didn't surrender kind of threw themselves off a cliff, a literal cliff. Um, and it's actually quite uncertain what happened to Julian Fadon himself. But that's kind of a cool little uh, slave revolt there that happened. And they were fighting for very progressive things for the time, basically an end to the slave society uh, for total emancipation and total freedom and egalitarianism on the island amongst all peoples. Well, the island has a revolutionary yeah, history. Yeah, absolutely does. It did not just quietly become a colony, as no colony basically did. Um, but so Julian Fadon actually is still, I believe, today uh, sung about in kind of native songs and was an inspiration to nationalist later leaders. Kind of like a Grenadian version of like what Jose Marti is in Cuba, possibly. Yeah, yeah. So fast forward a few hundred years, um, because we've got a lot to cover today, so unfortunately we can't spend too much time on the early years of colonialism in Grenada. Uh, but uh, I want to talk to you just briefly about um, some trade union activity, because it shows that there was even more. I just want to pick a time period to demonstrate even more so that there was more revolutionary history before uh, Eric, Gary, and the New Jewel movement, which we're going to get to eventually. Uh, but so one of these revolutionary movements or semi-revolutionary progressive movements was the uh, Granada Association, which was basically a union that was formed in 1920. Um, and it's everything okay, Grant? Yeah. Oh, you gave me a look. Uh, oh, Grenada, my bad. <laughs> yeah, I said Grenada instead of Grenada, my bad. We had a lengthy discussion before we went on air that it is pronounced Grenada, and it 100% is. And there I go saying Grenada again. <laughs> Uh, but it is the Grenada Association, my bad. Um, but it was formed in 1920, and it was kind of based on a teacher's union that was formed in 1913, seven years earlier. Um, and just jobs for the jobless was the main slogan of this union. Uh, but following World War I in Grenada, in which uh, several hundred to several thousand Grenadians actually went to go fight for the British in Europe and to fight its battles and uh, the, the war, the capitalist war, um, the soldiers were returning from this fight, and... They basically felt, rightly so, unappreciated for their service to the British. You know, many of them had fought and died for the British, and they come back to their ruled island, their island under colonial rule of the British, and what do they get in return? They just get economic subjugation and racial subjugation, and all the civil service jobs that some of them had basically fought for and should have rightly been appointed, uh, the soldiers, uh, were denied, basically, due to their race. Um, so the only benefiters of benefactors of British colonialism were the British by far. Um, but so post-war agitation was high basically um, and the Granada Association teamed up with some of the soldiers and other agitators uh, for equality to try and burn down the capital St. George in protest to British occupation on January 13th, 1920. Uh, they failed to burn it down unfortunately um, but it was sowed the seeds of further revolutionary and progressive movements. Um, and in 1931, a few years later, uh, they reformed and reorganized into the Grenada Workers Association, and they worked against a bill passed by the British Parliament uh, that increased duties on basic goods uh, and made it basically made them inaccessible to working Grenadians. Uh, and they lobbied and protested until its repeal in 1932, and in 1933 they actually won the right for trade unions to have official recognition. So 1933 was a big year because this basically lays the seeds for what Eric Gary does. Militant labor kind yeah, of comes exactly. to the country. Uh, so they fought for it. It didn't just magically happen overnight with Gary or the New Jewel movement. This was a long process. Oh, so move of, yeah. uh, you know, suddenly the British are going to start acting nice and uh, beneficial and yeah, generous. Yeah, exactly. Um, but these unions that were allowed to happen in 1933 kind of split off into smaller bodies. And it was by no means uh, still easy to unionize, but it became legal technically. Uh, but there were still harsh laws. Uh, it was still very hard to unionize. Um, 
But after World War II, the British Empire and other colonial empires began to crumble worldwide. Uh, France began to lose its territorial possessions, you know, first in Vietnam and then Algeria, both of which we've done shows on now. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the British began to lose their possessions all over the world. Uh, Egypt, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Israel, Palestine, uh, Greece, and elsewhere. And Grenada was another one of these countries that they started to lose their control of. Uh, enter Eric Gary. Eric Gary was born in the Grenadian Islands to a semi-wealthy family in 1922, and he received a pretty good education and worked as a school teacher in Trinidad for the U.S. Navy uh, for a little bit before working at an oil refinery. So he kind of left the island uh, to work around the Caribbean. Uh, but he returned to Grenada from Aruba in 1949, and immediately he starts to use his educational basis to kind of organize the people. Yep, gets involved in the local labor movement. Yes. And it's kind of its infancy, basically. Yeah, and so he works with the Grenada Manual Men Mental Workers Union and was able to basically better organize his union amongst kind of, I told you earlier, that the older unions had kind of split off into smaller fragmented groups, and he comes along with this new union, and he's a pretty powerful and charismatic guy for the time. In 1950 and 51, and or is able to quickly organize. So he organizes actually a mass general strike in 1951, February 1951, and it was initially against just a state, a states who were treating their servants basically very badly. But then it expanded. Uh, Gary's union took control of that initial strike and expanded it, and they called for road and utility workers. And then it, it, pretty soon, basically, the entire island was on strike. Um, and actually, this was such a big strike. The British Navy had to be called in. Uh, they occupied the island with heavy troop presence for months afterwards. Um, but the strike actually won them some concessions, uh, some mild liberal concessions. Uh, they were able to better organize after that. Um, they received some wage improvements, but there was basically token concessions, I would call them. No real systematic changes were to be had. Uh, and Gary also founded during this time the United Labor Party in 1950, um, and the strike leadership made him pretty popular, so he basically was able to become the leader of the country within a few years, receiving various yeah. posts. Grenada at this point had home rule, but not yeah. formal independence. So they had a, a small parliament, I guess you could call it, but that parliament was really very, had no real actual power, and was still, the entire island was still completely under the control of the British. Yep. Uh, but his party won five of the eight seats in the 1951 election after the successful strike, and Gary continued to secure some posts, and basically he became the island's most well-known and established political leader for a time until uh, the 70s. Um, but during this time, nothing really progressive happened, like I said, and especially for women, too. Uh, this is taken from a paper, too, that we're going to cite a lot later, but... Uh, for example, uh, quote, few daycare centers have been built, scholarships for women were not extended, equal work for equal pay was not implemented at all, and women in positions of power within the Gary regime, indeed, like the men, were not expected to oppose the decisions of the government. Uh, really just paltry justice everywhere, and for women as well, uh, token justice, uh, and just the appointment of a few ministerships. Once Gary basically, uh, in the 60s, Gary becomes... Uh, the prime minister of the island. Um, I believe he's governor general at one point, too, uh, I think. He's, I don't know if he's ever governor, he's governor general, he's but prime he was prime minister though, yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there was not huge uh, advancement in the popular yeah. position of women in the country or where they were economically, socially, yeah. politically, etc. And meanwhile, however, though, during the 50s and 60s, after the strike and Gary's slowly gaining more power and his liberal party is gaining more power, uh, there's the founding of lots of new trade unions. Uh, trade unions kind of ex explode and expand into all sectors or lots of sectors. It's still kind of difficult to organize, and trade union recognition isn't even yet uh, compulsory by any means, um, as it later will become, which we'll talk about. But uh, some expansion is happening. So here the real progressive movements are expanding out while Gary has kind of, Although he came from initially a progressive labor background, he kind of immediately went above that and away from that into just kind of a liberal establishment politics base, Yep, which is what he ran for 20, 25 years. To the point where he was basically someone who was so, uh, so like dedicated to keeping his own power that he would give some concessions when necessary. Yeah. For example, um, in the lead up to the 1976 elections, he would double the p wages of certain farm workers mm -hmm. so that the farm union would endorse him so that he yeah. could win re-election re relatively easily, things like that. It came to the point where he had gone from being kind of a national liberation 
hero to many Grenadians to the point where he was pretty much just just dedicated to keeping his own power in the country. Yeah, and he's someone also that I think the British knew that they could count on to kind of keep their colonial system going. Right, the even after the neo-colonial system yeah. after independence would come in 1974, yeah. which we're about to talk a little more on. Mm-hmm. Um, but so Gary was securing his power during this time until Maurice Bishop came to the country in 1970. Uh, Bishop was also born in Grenada uh, in May 1944, uh, and he also received a pretty good education like Gary um, and scholarships. Uh, and he met Bernard Coward, too, which is his later kind of lifelong revolutionary partner in grade school, whom he formed actually a bi-monthly discussion forum with in high school and in college on the island for a discussion of public issues and progressive policies, and this is in the 50s. One little nit to pick. Uh, looks like Bishop actually was born um, in Aruba, but his parents were Grenadian, and he would move oh, back to Grenada when he was that. a young child. Okay. But, yeah, there's also Aruba's very relatively close yeah. to Grenada, being, like a, I believe, a Dutch colony. And uh, there is, uh, there, we found in our research there's a continuous trend of people living in Aruba for a little while and then coming back to Grenada yeah. or something of that sort. Mm-hmm. But uh, Coward and Bishop, uh, Bernard Bishop, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Bernard Bishop, Bernard Coward and Maurice Bishop, excuse me, uh, both went abroad for uh, furthering their education in the 1960s. Uh, and Bishop goes to or went to law school at London University, and Coward went to Brandeis University in Massachusetts here in the States uh, before also going to the U.K. to further study politics, sociology, and political economy. And uh, Coward actually joined the Communist Party while he was in the U.K. So they CPGB. Both, yeah, so they both become kind of radicalized uh, while they're studying abroad. Uh, Coward also uh, studies um, sociology, like I mentioned, and then uh, Bishop also... Oh, what I wanted to mention was that, that what I wanted to mention is Bishop and Coward, while they were in the UK, actually worked to. Uh, I know Co- Bishop did at least to form a legal society to offer cheap financial and legal aid, particularly to fellow West Indians who had traveled to the UK, who were being kind of subjugated racially, mm-hmm. and found it hard to access cheap legal care, which they provided, which is really cool. Very. Um, but Bishop returned to Grenada in 1970 and immediately, basically, began organizing. Uh, rival political groups to Gary's, uh, like the Movement for the Assemblies of the People and the Movement for the Advance of the Community. Both Bishop and Cord by this time were basically Marxists, yeah. Marxist-Leninists, and um, they had basically the goal of, you know, radicalizing politics in Grenada by the time they'd come back, and this would culminate in 1973 when they uh, worked to form the New Jewel Movement yeah. between the Movement of... Uh, uh, pr- a movement of people's pr- uh, progress, I believe, or the advancement of the people's map. Yeah, movement yeah. of the advancement of the people's and the New Jewel movement when they combine to one uh, in one um, organization. New Jewel uh, j- movement was basically a radical Marxist organization mm-hmm. that had just formed. Jewel, actually, in that was an acronym. Uh, it was the New Joint Endeavor for Welfare, Education, and Liberation. Yes. And it became the main radical opposition to Gary's uh, regime. Yeah. Uh, just even before it won independence from Britain, this is uh, just a year before uh, independence was formally granted to Grenada in February of 1974. But they would uh, make their mark before then. Yeah. And actually, one little nit to pick I have is that... Uh, Actually, Coward didn't return yet until, I think, 1976, so he wasn't immediately, uh, he didn't immediately help on the forming of the party, but he certainly became a, quickly became a member when he did return to Grenada, I I believe, in 76. All right. Anyway, um, we're going to check each other's facts tonight, Grant. That's healthy, yeah. (laughs) That's (laughs) good. Healthy fact-checking. But, yeah, like Grant kind of hinted at, uh, Eric Gary, who is basically the de facto leader of the country at this point, was not at all a fan of these progressive populist movements. Um, He spoke out continuously throughout his his whole career against black power power movements, for example, um, and especially in Trinidad, where the black power movement was pretty strong. Um, And in May 23, 1970, he actually had a radio address about it in which he said, quote, it is said that when your neighbor's house is on fire, keep on wetting your own house. So keep on watering your own house to keep yours from getting on fire. And what wetting your own house really meant was the establishment of his own private police force, the Mongoose Gang, to mm-hmm. keep uh, radical movements in check. And, and to Maurice Bishop especially, check. black power was you know very important. Absolutely, yeah. uh, Grenada was a former slave colony and where like something like 90 plus percent of the population was black. So mm-hmm. this was you know very important as a 
part of the ideology of the New Jewel movement. Yeah. And Gary was trying to keep it from permeating Grenadian society. Yeah, yeah, it should be mentioned too. Gary, and yeah, uh, Grenada is predominantly a black country too. Most of the populace is black. So, um, so Gary actually was also black, and then so were uh, the leaders of New Jewel, including Coward and uh, Bishop. Uh, and many others. Um, but, uh, yeah, wedding your own house to Gary actually meant establishing a private police force to violently crack down on any progressive opposition. And it was formed in 1970, uh, around this time, after he gives a speech. And so they began to, he began to use the Mongoose police to crack down specifically on the New Jewel movement once he heard about its formation in 1973. Uh, and there's a specific incident, actually, that Grant can tell you more about than I can, but called Bloody Sunday on November 18th, 1973, when Bishop was actually specifically targeted for a beating, basically, right? Basically, yes. Um, this was right after the formation of the New Jewel movement. Um, this first, uh, to precipitate Bloody Sunday, which happened November of 18th, November 18th, of 1973, um, on November 4th, a couple weeks earlier, the New Jewel movement held a People's Congress in the town of Simun in Grenada, and they publicly voiced and passed a resolution called the People's Indictment, in which Gary and the Mongoose Gang were condemned uh, as despotic, corrupt, authoritarian figures that had no business leading the Grenadian people. <laughs> now, the, the, here's a little segment from the People's Indictment. Quote, the Gary government was born in blood, baptized in fire, christened with bullets, is married to foreigners, and is resulting in the death of our people. So, very, very, like, hard-hitting criticism yeah, attack on absolutely. Gary's government. And, uh, apparently, uh, Gary did find out uh, that uh, this meeting had happened, and this was basically, like, showing him that, oh, fuck, wow, this new jewel movement is, like, really... <laughs> pushing people, it's radicalizing people, yeah. this could be dangerous. And they, basically, the Duffus Report, which was collaborated in 1975, detailing some of the uh, past political um, squabbles yeah. and uh, controversies and the you know hard-hitting repressions that had happened in this time preceding um, 1975, uh, it found that uh, basically Gary's administration arrived to the conclusion that armed insurrection by New Jewel was on the horizon. Yeah. So, on November 18th, uh, Gary's secret police uh, actually followed two cars with six New Jewel members um, in them to Grenville, where they were going to have a meeting. Uh, Maurice Bishop was one of the people in these two cars. The inspector, Innocent Belmar, he really wasn't that innocent, but uh, he was basically waiting for the men to arrive at their destination, to stop the cars in Grenville, uh, before he got out of his vehicle and shouted, Get them, dogs! And uh, basically... Uh, there were of these six people that got out of the cars. One group of three went one way, and another group with Bishop went another way. Now the first group escaped for a, a few hours before they were captured. Uh, however, the police mainly went after Bishop's group, which ran down an alleyway in mm -hmm. Grenville. So uh, some of the Mongoose gang and regular police forces sh um, basically chased them down, shot at them. They actually pulled out their pistols and shot at them, although they didn't kill anyone. They didn't hit anyone. Um, and they cornered uh, Bishop and two other men, and they beat them into submission with the butts of their pistols and these wooden clubs that they had. Bishop uh, had was really hurt. He got a broken jaw and, yeah. like, significant head trauma. In fact, uh, Air Gary's administration was pressured into airlifting him to Barbados for an emergency surgery, um, which probably saved his life. Yeah. He was then later released and did not go through a lengthy prison term. He really was almost killed, basically, by this beating, though, right? Yes, yeah. it was seriously a brutal beating. So that's just one example of Eric Gary's, quote, democratic politics, which he liked to implement by brutally suppressing uh, any progressive opposition to him. So you can see why uh, the, New Jewel, the New Jewel movement leaders, specifically uh, Coward and Bishop, like, felt the need to use uh, very violent and harsh language when dealing with the Gary government is because they were doing not just the same to them with words, but with action, too. Another instance I read of the Mongoose gang activities was, uh, I believe it's after official independence is given in February 1974 sometime, but um, Gary's having a party, basically a cocktail party, with all his rich lawyer friends and whatnot, his rich liberal friends, and down below their high-rise building, basically, that they're having this rich people party at, this rich liberal party at, um, down below, a few stories, and next to them, in an adjacent, in an adjacent building, basically, the Mongoose gang uh, lit the building on fire because they knew that some New Jewel Movement sympathizers were living there. So it's a very interesting image to think about, uh, it's, and it's really true, but think about uh, 
thinking about uh, the liberal politicians sitting above us all, literally having their cocktail parties while the world burns below them and they burn their opposition below them. Yeah, it's them. a perfect analogy yeah. to the system at large. So that is global indeed. Global capitalism yeah. and neocolonialism. Yeah. And in Grenada, too, in this case example we're looking at. Um, but so that's the type of crap the Mongoose gang pulled under Gary, and you bet that he ordered basically most of them. Now, uh, yeah. leading up into independence, uh, which happened in uh, the first week, I believe, of February of 1974, which Gary, um, that basically had been his crown jewel of his administration, and that he was actively negotiating with the governor general from, of Britain to get uh, Grenada independence from the United Kingdom. And uh, he was basically granted a date. They said, okay, uh, February 1974, mm -hmm. uh, independence for Grenada will happen. And this was uh, basically Gary's big thing that he was really yeah. proud of, that he'd secured formal independence. Now, what he was embarrassed about was the month leading into independence. Um, right after New Year's of 1974, a huge nationwide general strike had been called in Grenada that mobilized you know, professionals and farm workers, um, middle class, uh, poor rural peasants, yeah. etc. This and like was this covered like whole sections of society. And, and New this, Jewel was pretty imp implemental and incremental in leading this. I yes, imagine. they were they were huge in like organizing the strike. The strike lasted three weeks with a, and uh, it spiked with a general with a striking population at one time of twenty five thousand people. Now that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but with uh, considering Grenada's population, that was more than a third of the total adult population at the time. Now try imagine try imagining like I don't know thirty five or forty percent of Americans going out on strike. You know that would be huge. That would be tens and tens of millions of people. This was a huge general strike relative to the size of the country in general, and it culminated with a riot in St. George's, St. George's being the capital of Grenada, a neighborhood in St. George's that led many to take refuge in a union building um, of Gren Grenadian fishermen, uh, the, Grenadian, the Grenada Seamen and Waterfront Workers Union. And uh, despite the presence of many women, women and children in the building who had fled from this riot, who went in to take refuge in the building, the Mongoose Gang uh, filled the building with tear gas, basically, um, while and there was no ventilation, you know, just an enclosed uh, dock workers uh, uh, union building. They f you know, flew, threw in you know, tear gas and everything. They didn't care that there were ch children and women who had nothing to do with uh, labor militancy yeah. in there. Um, it got to the point where the uh, smoke in the building from the tear gas was so bad that people started breaking windows open with their hands to try and get some ventilation going. And it was just totally chaotic situation. It culminated when Rupert Bishop, the father of Maurice Bishop, was shot dead by a mongoose policeman at the HQ of mm -hmm. this uh, union building in the presence of his wife and his daughter, or Bishop's sister, Maurice Bishop's sister. In the same report, the Duffus report, released a year later, later makes it public that the looting of local businesses in the, during this riot was done by the mongoose gang in the aftermath of that riot and the murder of Bishop's father. Which I'm sure they blamed on, you know, New Jewel movement members, right? Members, right, right. Yeah. But this is the Duffus report was like an official government report too, right? Or yes, was handed to the it government? was um, done in collaboration with uh, the name Duffus comes from the Governor General of Jamaica, actually. Oh, I who, see. Um, so he it's had an, an official external position. independent yeah. investigation. Uh, the That's, Governor yeah. General of Jamaica actually was um, he identified very closely with the New Jewel movement and didn't like Gary at all. So he, um, this Jamaican politician, went and. Uh, helped uh, formulate all this evidence against Gary, and he signed up on it, and that's why it's called the Duffus Report, which is kind of neat of him. Hmm. Yeah. I think there's a State, State Department report here yeah. from 1978. Yeah, even the State off. Department of the U.S. said that these guys weren't too good. It says, quote, uh, the formation of the infamous Mongoose Gang in 1970, an illegal act since Gary had no legal authority to establish law enforcement agencies outside the provision of the law of the state, unleashed a series of unspeakable atrocities against the Grenada citizenry, constituting a veritable reign of terror. So you know these guys are bad if even the U.S., the bully of the entire world, was saying, you know, maybe these guys aren't so great for, quote, democracy. You like to tone it down a little, yeah. Gary. So this was what... Gary's, quote, democracy really looked like in Grenada. It was pretty horrible for the people, and especially if you were opposed to Gary's government, you can bet your butt you were going to get beaten up in some alley by the mongoose game. And I think a little... Have your house burned We have a little clip we're going to play now. I think this perfectly shows just what kind of person Gary was. Yeah. This is from a press conference in 1974 um, about people who have been opposed to him politically and militantly. Here's what he said. He's even been called the Idi Amin of the Caribbean by some critics. There are said to have been attempts on his life, 
But at this press conference in 1974, Gary didn't seem too concerned. People have tried to get rid of me, and I don't think they can make it. Lots of them who have tried are lying in the cemetery. How did they die? How are they doing? How did they die? <laughs> Natural causes. So, uh, in case you couldn't hear, what that journalist said was, how did they die? And Gary laughed it off and said, natural causes, with a smile. Yeah. So pretty messed up. <laughs> Gary basically was acknowledging there, acknowledging there in public that he'd had his political opponents basically assassinated or had them beaten to death or had their houses burned. And that he ground. could laugh about it yeah. publicly in front of a crowd of journalists, yeah. many of whom were foreign. So, really creepy and unnerving. Uh, Gary's a weird guy, very, <laughs> very yeah. evil man, basically. Um, full independence, however, was granted to Grenada in February of 1974, despite all of this chaos and civil unrest that had precipitated the previous month with the big general strike. Mm -hmm. Although it did remain, and still does remain to this day, in the British Commonwealth. So uh, basically, Grenadians um, still recognize uh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth as the head of state, and they still recognize uh, the legitimacy of the British yeah. throne. And independence at this time, too, in the 70s, really meant... You're going to be independent on paper, but you're still going to be heavily reliant on, you know, European aid and right. IMF loans and World Bank loans. Sort of neo-colonialism, yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. That, and it still really is an effect today for yeah. many African countries, Absolutely nations is. in the global south, etc. So, another interesting thing, Maurice Bishop, this is just a couple weeks after his father was killed by the by the Mongoose gang in the presence of his family. Bishop was arrested just a few hours before independence became official in February by the Mongoose gang because... They raided his home and they found rifle sights, ammunition, camping equipment, and schematics of Gary's home <laughs> upon a search of his home. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty obvious yeah. what, what Bishop has been planning on. Right before his arrest, Bishop said, quote, Repression has certainly increased at all levels. The whole society is tattering and falling apart. There's a great deal of division. People are talking about civil war, that sort of thing, end quote. Mm -hmm. So resources are its basically the epitome of a neoliberal regime in the 70s under Gary, you know, Everything's great if you're a rich lawyer or you're part of the ruling class and the establishment bourgeoisie politics on the island. But if you're a common person, you know, you're, you're, chances are you're actually illiterate at this time, uh, that you have trouble accessing food, that you have no social mobility access whatsoever, you can't access good education because yes. it's too expensive. With that general strike, mm -hmm. um, they said that food was becoming really scarce. Yeah. Um, people um, who were like losing their jobs because of their affiliation with the strike had to live on their savings for an extended yeah. period of time, not knowing if they were going to make it, if they were going to go hungry or their yeah. families. And I think this is from a later bit in the show, too, but we found a quote later on that says, but Grenada was an island nation, but before the New Jewel movement takes power in 1979, which we'll get to in a second, they were still importing most of their fish in right. the nation, which is so messed They were up so heavily about. reliant yeah. on imports, yeah. and they exported relatively little. Yeah. And uh, the export sector uh, just wasn't really, it wasn't comparable to how much they were importing. It was just so expensive, and they were importing fish despite you know yeah. being surrounded by the beautiful Caribbean Sea with like so, so much fishing yeah. opportunity right there below them. So it's pretty messed up, the wastage and that was going on uh, basically for the profit of the liberal establishment and Gary's regime on the island. It was politically independent but economically dependent. Absolutely, definitely. yeah. Um, so Gary's overthrow basically is precipitated by the 1976 general elections on the island uh, in which Gary's mongoose gang basically intimidates the hell out of the political opposition. Uh, there had been growing civil unrest and discontent in Grenada and many people were hoping to show this with their vote in the election. Uh, but as we'll tell you... Yes, I believe even New Jewel mm -hmm. actually joined forces with a conservative party that just because it was anti-Gary, yeah. that they were willing to work so across the aisle yeah, like that absolutely. just because they were anti-Gary, they were willing to get Gary out of power. So they really were dedicated to just getting Gary out of power and like facilitating some actual democratic reform mm -hmm. in Grenadian society. However, with Gary's political uh, op uh, intimidation on the opposition, he won nine out of the 15 seats in the 1976 election, which rubber-stamped him for another five years, I believe, as prime minister. Yeah, but this 1976 election is really heavily contested. Basically, uh, it's thought that the mongoose game was used to intimidate all political opposition and to suppress voter turnout. I mean, voter turnout was uh, much less than it should have been normally. It was like 63%, which is very low for Grenadian standards. Uh, 
And many foreign sources said that the 1976 general election was fraudulently conducted. I mean, many reporters and investigators said it was fraudulently conducted. And it's basically commonly held belief today that the New Jewel movement basically should have won that election, I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. So it's <laughs> very unclear. Uh, it, I guess evidence is hard to find for the corruption, uh, but it's. I think it's the yeah. mongoose gang's actions before speak for itself, as do their actions. And at the same the time, uh, historical texts and sources on Grenada are kind of limited. Yeah. It hasn't been written about that much relatively to a lot of other conflicts of the time, which makes sense. It's such a small country, but um, a lot of this is some. Some of this is conjecture that uh, has been written about in some of these like historical mm-hmm. texts that you kind of just have to like. Give a little, yeah. give a little rope to because um, there's not much other to the contrary that can actually be supported in the uh, historiography. Mm-hmm. Um, so things got bad after the 1976 election. Uh, this was a time when actual like there was street conflicts between the New Jewel militants and the Mongoose Gang in like St. George's and Grenville, yeah. uh, like towns across the island, basically. And the culmination of this arrest came in March of 1975 when the New Jewel movement uh, was finally organized and large enough that it could launch a revolution. And March that's exactly 1979. What it did. Yeah, 1979, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, slip of the mouth, yes. Uh, regime was, uh, so Gary's regime got overthrown by armed New Jewel militants in March of 1979. Gary was not even in the country when this happened. He was out actually in New York City at the UN when it happened because, this is kind of interesting, he'd yeah. been... Gary vehemently believed in um, UFO um, investigation, basically, and uh, he thought that had been what had happened thus far had been relatively limited, and that uh, the, basically he wanted the American and Soviets to, um, and British, I believe, to just give up all what they knew about UFOs to the UN, so that like, a, a formal task force in the United Nations could be made to investigate yeah. UFO phenomena. He had some scientists and uh, one former astronaut on his side uh, to try and ma- make this task force. Um, into like a formal body at the United Nations because clearly yeah. that was the most pressing issue for Gary at this point, right? Yeah, um, that speaks. It's another great analogy. An for international liberalism. agency yeah. on UFO investigation. Yeah, like, rather than dealing with the material conditions on the ground that were horribly disaffecting the population of his own country in, in Grenada, he's thinking with his heads up way in the clouds with ideas about UFOs. Right? Yes. And thinking on the ground, which is insane. Priorities in order, <laughs> yeah. definitely. UFOs are more important than the poverty and subjugation of my own people. So, while he was gone, the New Jill movement uh, launched this huge revolution in which they basically started in the early morning hours, 4 a.m. on uh, March 13th, I believe it was. They, you know, went around the country um, to like homes of ministers where they would basically get them while they were in bed and everything and they actually raided Gary's house and they found oh like well he's not here no one's here so yeah. there's video of the new jewel movement just entering Gary's home well like it's like <laughs> ransack because they uh, yeah, they couldn't find him or anyone there actually so it's like crazy how it happened and with such a small country there was only a few key people they just had to find I believe like a few of his cabinet ministers uh, leaders in the Mongoose gang, That's that was it. They basically mm-hmm. had control of the government now, and that was the revolution of 1979. And that's when New Jewel, the Marxist New Jewel movement in Grenada came to power. Yep. And Gary was given uh, basically political asylum by President Carter because yeah. uh, because he was in New York at the time of yeah. it happening. So Carter did give Gary um, the right to stay in the U.S. without extraditing him to um to Grenada so that he could be put on trial or anything, or jailed possibly by the New Jewel movement. Mm-hmm. And so there were just gobs and gobs and gobs of social gains that were had under the New Jewel movement. New Jewel movement's uh, rule from 1979 to its overthrow in 1983 by the U.S. government. Uh, and I'm going to take lots of this uh, information about social gains from a very well-written paper I read uh, called Women in the Grenada, the Grenada Revolution 1979 through 1983 by Nicole Philip Dow, which was published in 2013. But just because I'm using this one source so much, I thought I should say it on air. But so one of the things that the uh, New Jewel movement did, and it's called the People's Revolutionary Government at this point is what the government was officially called, uh, was that they launched a massive national literacy campaign. So uh, approximately 40% of the population was functionally illiterate in 1979, and by 1983 they had 98% literacy, which is just insane to think about that there was that much literacy had uh, that was gained in a four-year period. Huge That's, teaching campaign. Yeah, amazing. Uh, 
And they did this partly by opening, uh, quote, centers for the popular education, they were called, uh, and CPE, centers for the popular education, basically directly on the grassroots level in neighborhoods gave mass instruction to local communities. Um, and I want to spend some time, too, to talk about the subject of that paper, uh, which is women in the revolution. And because it's really a case example, too, of how organizing from the ground up leads to actual social and systematic change. You can't just do it from the top down, like many liberals would have you believe. <laughs> so uh, it takes organizing from the ground up, and uh, the National Women's Organization, which was founded by the People's Revolutionary Government and the New Jewel Movement, shows this. Uh, and it was led, actually, the National Women's Organization, by Phyllis Cohort, who was the very cool and awesome wife of uh, Bernard Cohort. Phyllis Cohort's pretty sweet. Uh, but she did so many things with the National Women's Organization, so I'm just going to kind of go through and list a lot of them that I can. Uh, so one of the things that they obviously did was that they worked to have a parity with boys and girls in schools and the education system, uh, and they worked to have parity in the workforce, and uh, they worked to have uh, better women's health. Uh, and it's really an example of grassroots organizing, uh, based on some quotes that I have here, too, uh, from the paper. Uh, they went uh, to individual communities, and once or twice every two months, a member of the National Women's Organization executive attended groups and explained the programs of the revolution. So basically, uh, they had parishes and local neighborhood chapters in Grenada that elected women to big organizational conferences and whatnot from the very ground up. and. Some of these meetings were kind of compulsory, but what it really did was just encourage mass participation in the democratic system that they were building from the ground up so that uh, it was actually democratic and actually all the leaders really did come from the people for the most part. Uh, so they were elected from the very ground up up to these higher up organizations. Uh, and they had voluntary projects like road repair, the building of community centers, community cleanups, and island-wide beautification programs. Uh, that would paint bridges and walls, I'm quoting from the paper again, uh, clearing drains and overgrown shrubbery and house rebuilding. By December 1982, one in every nine families had received house repair materials so that they could improve their own homes if they needed to. Another thing that the National Women's Organization did was to launch a national campaign to provide uh, milk for babies feeding and cooking oil just for general cooking practices uh, to women across the island and families across the island. Uh, in 1981, they were distributing, this program was so successful that they were distributing 4,000 kilograms of free milk powder per month, which is doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a huge amount if you consider the population of Grenada, which was, what, at the time, like 80,000 people? 90,000, 90, I think. people. So that's 4,000 kilograms of free milk powder for nothing to families that desperately needed it is awesome. Um, they also, during this time, were... Uh, important in helping to build cooperatives for small-scale farming and employment so they would have, you know, do it the way you're kind of supposed to now that some sustainability advocates are mentioning and talking about today. Back in 1980, back in the 19, early 1980s, the National Women's Organization was doing this in Grenada, helping to organize small neighborhood-based community farms rather than large-scale farms that have to have you use pesticides and uh, the like and BT corn and whatnot, just to, which are horrible for the environment. So it was environmentally good as well as economically sound. Uh, and the literacy program we mentioned earlier too was actually run by a woman, uh, Valerie Gordon, who is only 24 years old, which is kind of awesome. So, Young school teacher. Yeah. And she she leads the entire nation's yeah, literacy program, which is amazing. Um, and here's a quote about it from. Uh, education program also revolved around not just literacy, but educating people economically, too, about their role to play in the country and how important it was. So this is from organizer Decima Williams. Uh, she said, quote, that we spent time explaining the structure of the world economy to rural women so that when they produce bananas, carry them on their heads for long distances, sell them to the National Marketing Board, and are paid the small prices that they are they do not think the government is keeping back some of the money and paying them me meager wages. We teach them that we, as one small country, do not control the price for bananas internationally. So they're just telling people about the system and uh, trying to uh, tell them and educate them about uh, how important their role was and try and get them to understand that it was probably the U.S. who was basically manufacturing banana prices and making them very crappy, not the government, which was the real truth. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, the... NWO also organized maternity leave and had it guaranteed for women, uh, and there were hefty fines and threatening language 
by Bishop that was to be had to any employer that refused to do this. Uh, there was an even, even an instance of a woman who was fired for getting pregnant who worked at a cafe, I think, and uh, her employer fired her basically when she got pregnant, uh, and her logic was that uh, she, her employer, was an old woman who had not received maternity leave care. She lived under the Gary yeah, years. Yeah, during the Gary years, so why should her employees get it now? Uh, but Bishop said hell no to that, and he fined her immediately uh, 500 East Caribbean dollars, which... It was a hefty sum. Yeah, definitely. at the time it was a hefty sum. Uh, and so with this kind of grassroots change that's happening in local neighborhood-based organizing from the ground up all the way up to the higher-ups, uh, it actually made a difference now when ministers were appointed to her women. It's no longer just token justice if women are involved in all levels of society as opposed to just the very top. Uh, so when women were given positions like Jacqueline Kreft was to be Minister of Education or Phyllis Coward as the member of the Central Committee, the only woman on the Central Committee of the entire national, that's like the executive basically of yep. the, the island, uh, Demisa Williams, who I quoted from earlier as uh, the representative to the Organization of American States, uh, it actually meant something. And you also had women leading the media boards, the youth boards, uh, the women's boards, uh, the food and nutrition board, the health board, the tourism board, the marketing board, and more. So it actually was making a difference. Uh, Phyllis Coward said that the benefits for women were mostly psychological, though, and I think there's some truth to this, but uh, because they were getting economic parity finally with men, they felt confident enough, and it showed. And she said, quote, that in how many Caribbean countries would you find hundreds of women with no more than primary education, confidently leading group meetings, as well as organizing cultural activities, fundraising, field trips, and many other activities? And this is so true, I think, like, uh, at the time... Uh, it empowers people and oppress people when you actually start to help them out and teach them that they are respected and show them that. And I think that's very true. Uh, and it was very popular with not just, you know, Phyllis Coward, who was on the CENTCOM, but also with the actual people, too. A 72-year-old uh, great-grandmother of Birch Grove, this is from that one paper again, had this to say, uh, quote, I am with the revolution and the government 1,009%. After the revolution, we formed our women's group here in Birch Grove. Progress gave me new energy. I wanted to fight on for my grandchildren because I saw it in, the, in some future. Women is real, real out now. We feeling more confident. We heart open now. Uh, basically, the only thing I would argue that the National Women's Organization did wrong, and basically uh, you can say this about the People's Revolutionary Government too, is that perhaps they didn't go far enough on some of their progressive issues. But the National Women's Organization, for example, uh, didn't uh, expand rape penalty charges. They were still capped at three-year prison sentences. Uh, they didn't encourage female officers in the Army, for example. Um, so they didn't go far enough in some aspects. But they, I think the National Women's Organization is truly a demonstration of what a real progressive society does for the people, especially truly a national minorities. liberation yeah. for Grenadian women. Absolutely. Widely supported. Um, another thing that happened uh, during the New Jewel movement was unionization jumped massively because they basically made it compulsory to recognize unions in 1979. So it jumped from 30 to 80 percent by 1980. A year. Yeah, within 1979 to 1980, which is just insane to think about. If that were to happen in this country, we would be living in the Socialist Republic of the United States within That's, a year. would be very happy, yeah. folks, yes. Yeah, that would be insane. <laughs> that type of social reorganization is just crazy to think about. Uh, and creativity also exploded during this time under the New Jewel movement. People often say that, you know, Marxist governments absolutely suppress all creativity and they destroy art and uh, the make you idea a monotonous of the society. Yeah, like but that. that's not true at all. It empowers people because you actually start treating them with, with respect. They no longer have to worry about, will they have enough food on my plate at the end of the it week? It gives the individual new tools to express their yeah. creativity that they didn't have under capitalism or whatever exploitative system mm -hmm. that immediately preceded socialism. Yeah, and it also lets people who couldn't participate in former cultural trends participate in them uh, now what, because they're no longer as ridiculously economically and uh, oppressed by other means. Yeah. And so one example of this is that for the first time ever, uh, a woman won the Calypso Monarch Award, which is basically a local fest festival in 1983. Um, and here's a popular poem of the revolution that was created during this time, too, that was popular nationally and not artificially, but it was genuinely really a popular poem. And it was written by Helena Joseph, who was a school teacher, a young school teacher. And she said, quote, I militia, I conscious militia, you, Mr. Exploiter, you spread propaganda about Grenada through the me media. I malicious say I conscious militia. Uh, malicious say you can't leave us to suffer. 
is the heavy roller for you, Mr. Exploiter. Ah, pick up me AK oppressor. To fight you, counter to free the worker, to build Grenada, I militia will never surrender. Um, and I should note, too, that uh, Grenadians have kind of a Creole accent, typically. Like, yeah, yeah. think like the way that uh, Jamaican patois uh, yeah. exists. It's kind of like, it's English, but it's a very distinct uh, accent, a very distinct like dialect of English. Grenada's yeah. got basically the same thing, yes. so this is in sort of an English Creole. Yeah, exactly. But I think the, I think the meaning still crosses over yeah, very well. Mm -hmm. So it was just, uh, the revolution did so much for so many people, especially women and the unemployed and... <laughs> It was truly a mass progressive movement and one of the best, I think, that history has had because it's just kind of an amazing time. Definitely. And uh, the U.S. had a few things to say about this destabilization, mm -hmm. uh, about like this whole empowerment. And this is in the form of destabilization that they said it. This was seen as dangerous to the United States that this sort of social, radical social transformation in society and the economy was happening. A few more statistics real quick about what happened in this period. Unemployment under the New Jewel, Mo New Jewel Movement's programs dropped from 49% to 14%. The government diver diversified agriculture. This is from Truthout, by the way. It's a great article. Um, they decreased imports from more than 40% to 28% at a time when market prices for agricultural products were collapsing worldwide. They increased exports, which I'll touch about in a little bit. They also um, vastly increased the amount of schools in the country. To, this is part of the literacy campaign where they were teaching people for the first time in their life, adults, to read and write. So, one of the first attempts at American destabilization of the revolutionary government in Grenada came with the Queens Park bombing, 1980, June 19, 1980. Uh, this was a very memorable episode in Grenadian history mm -hmm. that uh, still affects people today, that's still widely remembered. Large rally of over a thousand people in St. George's, the capital, on a national holiday. Um, so a bomb was planted under a platform that seated Maurice Bishop, the prime minister, his entire his uh, ministry cabinet, the Cuban ambassador to Grenada, and the British governor general Schoon. The bo a bomb explodes under this platform. However, it doesn't kill any of um, the you know national leadership in the New Jewel uh, party or anything like that. However, it does kill three young schoolgirls. You know, these are children, and yeah. it injures a hundred people. New Jewel Movement launched an investigation, and they found CIA activity on the island. And uh, on the national radio, Radio Free Grenada, uh, Maurice Bishop talked about, "Hey, there's an American destabilization attempt at our island, and we're not going to let them win." Absolutely not. And also, uh, Nick told me this from one of his sources that uh, the killing of these young women um, from this bombing uh, got basically women to really militarized in the country, yeah, yeah. and they joined the military en masse after that, Yeah, the, the People's Revolutionary yeah. Army. Uh, recruits, I think, went from like 35% women to 50% women within a few months after the bombing. So rather than pacify people like the CIA probably wanted it to, it invigorated them, and they said, hell no, we're going to fight and keep our government that's done so much for us. That was the first major act of uh, destabilization that happened by the U.S. on yeah. Grenada. Uh, that was um, a few months before uh, President Carter left office. When President Reagan entered office, he recalled the U.S. ambassador, Sally Shelton Colby, a month into office, February of 1981, right after he took office, and then he closed the U.S. embassy in Grenada. Carter had kept it open. Yeah. Um, however, Reagan decided to close the embassy. Um, New Jewel Movement immediately sought reproachment with Reagan. They wanted to reestablish a Grenadian embassy. They wanted to m put a Grenadian embassy back in D.C., and they wanted an American embassy in St. George's. The U.S. wouldn't even open a consulate in Grenada. They ha we have at least an information section with Cuba before we you know, reestablished our own uh, embassy uh, in Cuba in 2015, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't even do the same thing to Grenada. We gave them a worse diplomatic treatment than we did Cuba during this entire time, which is you know, crazy to think about. And additionally, there were hundreds of American students traveling to Grenada to study. Um, you know, St. George's uh, Medical School is where that was one of the things that we used to precipitate our invasion, that we were scared about what uh, was going to happen to American citizens. But, you know, there had been a long tradition through the New Jewel Movement uh, that when they were governed, that American students still kept yeah, traveling to Grenada to study. absolutely welcome to Grenada. Yeah. Absolutely. And even Grenadian citizens who had never left their country before, they were given, for the first time, scholarships to travel abroad mm -hmm. to Western countries and even to Eastern Bloc countries. Yeah, like so Bulgaria. They, yeah, I remember they were, reading an account of a student going there. They yeah. were given, you know, opportunity to travel the world by the new revolutionary government. And, you know, American citizens were still more than welcome to come to Grenada both as tourists and as students.
Um, Reagan administration ignored Grenada's uh, reproachment for closer relations, and Grenada would try repeatedly to get closer, um, more peaceful relations with mm -hmm. the U.S. The U.S. also, in 1983, would formulate the Caribbean Basin Initiative in 19, uh, to facilitate basically uh, trade and commerce with small nations across the Caribbean, and it would have been beneficial to Grenada. Grenada was yeah. the only country that was originally in this agreement to be pushed out of it by the U.S. <coughs> Grenada. Grenada really wanted to be part of the Caribbean Basin Initiative, <coughs> and again, Reagan would not allow it. Yeah. Didn't Bishop even visit the U.S. during this time, too, right? Yes, summer of <coughs> 1983, and he tried repeatedly, repeatedly to get an audience with a member of Reagan's administration or Reagan himself, but he was shrugged off. Yeah. And now, he did deliver some speeches to um, different officials yeah. and diplomats and in with D.C. with other U.S. officials, right? Yes. So it's not but like it was totally closed to him. It was just Reagan. The, the Reagan right. administration itself refused to meet with the him. The prime minister was in D.C. wanting to pursue a dialogue with the president yeah. of the United States. Do we have that clip of... totally ignored. We have that clip of Reagan's justification for the invasion too later. I can pull it up. Yeah, we should pull that up because listen to what Grant and I just told you the truth and what Reagan will tell you which is basically entirely lies <laughs> so <laughs> the only other country in the Caribbean that this willful exclusion occurred to was Cuba and this basically further necessitated that Grenada had to ally itself with Cuba because it was its one, one of the only nations in the region that wasn't that couldn't bow, bow to US pressure basically because mm -hmm. it also had a socialist revolutionary government in power and then Reagan had the nerve to be mad at Grenada for allying with Cuba, yeah. even though the U.S., uh, even though Grenada wanted to be closer to the U.S., it he would totally shrug them off yeah. every time. It won't take yes for an answer. Again, Bishop visited the U.S. and tried numerous times to meet with Reagan, again. and Reagan just refused outright, and it was not publicized properly. So again, the this period of '79 to '83. Huge improvements in Grenadian society. Mm -hmm. Universal health care, the advancement of women politically, socially, and economically, trade unions empowered, literacy taught to the masses, mass political education. People were allowed to leave the country for the first time to study and enrich themselves abroad, both east and west. And schools were built, national uh, economic revitalization programs, and everything. And, uh, however, there was still problems in Grenada, and there were political factions in the New Jewel movement that had disagreements, yeah. and these would boil over soon. Bernard Cord, we, who we've talked about, the husband of Phyllis Cord. Yeah, great school friends with Bishop. Yes. He was, um, un under the New Jewel revolutionary government, he was the Minister of Finances. So he basically ran the Grenadian economy, mm -hmm. and he did a pretty good job at it. Um, he, had a, he launched a few campaigns under his administration about uh, decreasing imports and increasing exports to help the Grenadian economy. They had a few slogans, eat local, build the revolution, and another one means freedom means feeding yourself. And that one was used to cut down on foreign food imports, mm -hmm. uh, like Nick said about how you know, they were so reliant on fish imports, even though they're a country, an island country, that you know, traditionally those, those countries usually um, produce a lot of yeah, you know, yeah. fishing uh, resources. However, Grenada wasn't doing it. Under so, the Gary administration. Right. Yeah. And this was totally changed when Cord was the Minister of Finances. They cut down on foreign imports soon, like I said. Um, they cut them down by almost by half in a really short amount of time. And they it greatly increased their exports. Grenadian produce, mangoes, nutmeg, mm -hmm. tamarinds, etc. At the time, Grenada was producing a third of the world's nutmeg yeah. supply, mm -hmm. a tiny little country. Trying to do a process, I believe, called import substitution industrialization, yeah. where you substitute what you're importing and try and then export that and build what you were formerly importing. And it was making really good results mm -hmm. for the Grenadian economy. It grew by 6% in this first year um, of, the, of the revolutionary government. And this was a time when most Caribbean island economies actually were in recession. Um, and the World Bank even went out of its way to praise Cord's um, running of the Grenadian economy and said he was doing a great job. Yeah. And, they were and they were guiding the country successfully and with prosperity through times where most countries in the, in the area were hurting. And most other countries in the area, aside from Cuba, were part of the establishment neo uh, neoliberal global capitalist um, system. Yeah, absolutely. Grenada had bro broken free of that, and it was seeing the results given to it paying, paying in dividends. Um, also, what Cord focused on was tourism development. It's a small, beautiful um, Caribbean island country, and it was very dependent on tourism. And uh, the revolutionary government built hotels, and they would even go into, as if you know anything more about the American invasion, this is going to come up later, the airport was an airport was constructed in St. George's to increase the tourism volume, but Reagan maintained that it was for Soviet and Cuban aircraft. Yeah. Hmm. We'll address this claim in detail in a bit, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So, and also, tourists said the revolution was positive. It made the people happier. Absolutely. They saw yeah. development really <laughs> happening in the country. You know, a lot of people go to, you know, countries 
where they're very poor but beautiful and they you know can't get past you know seeing the poverty and the miseration of the people but that was changing in Grenada people yeah. were genuinely seeing improvements in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So Coward then was responsible for a lot of actually the economic improvement and really the day-to-day -day life improvement like Grant was telling you about. Uh, that was kind of Coward's job or his share of the responsibilities. But Maurice Bishop was actually really more of a revolutionary leader and in some ways a figurehead. He, granted, he was doing a lot of the administration work. Um, we don't mean to... He was probably overworked was, yeah, significantly. But he was, yeah, he was very much overworked, but he was... Coward actually was the one doing kind of a lot of and coming up with a lot of the party's new programs and economic programs to help the day to day out. stuff. Basically, yeah. Coward was taken care of. Mm -hmm. While as Bishop was kind of almost a cult of personality, unfortunately, had developed around him a bit. Um, he was a great speaker. He was really charismatic. He was the one who would you know come to the come to the meetings and speak off the cuffs off the cuff to crowds and inspire them. Uh, and rally them and lead seminars and uh, group discussions. Um, and you would also kind of execute the will of the central committee. Uh, with yeah. democratic centralism, that's how it works. You typically have one leader of the central committee who kind of executes the will of what it votes on, a small yep. committee of, you know, Central a committee people. chosen by the yeah. people. They vote on day-to-day -day. Um, on legislation and yeah. everything. Uh, but Bishop was really becoming exhausted by 1983, doing all the officialdom and everything himself. And uh, also the things were kind of slowing down a bit and the party had been discussing for about a year about how to really consolidate uh, power and make things more efficient and make uh, really develop more of a Marxist line in this vanguard because up until that time really it had been just doing a lot of progressive reforms some people felt that it should be kind of sped up so one way to do this they thought was to maybe have a joint leadership a co-leadership between Bishop and Coward. Coward was the deputy prime yeah. minister and they basically proposed put them on equal ground right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they proposed basically, they thought this was a good idea, and it does sound like a good idea on paper, because then Bishop can continue to do what he does best, and they can divide labor more. Bishop can do what he does best, which is kind of uh, being basically a charismatic leader, whereas Coward can do what he did best and be the economic and programs leader. So it would have been a pretty good solution, uh, probably. Um, and the Central Committee passed it on September 25th, 1983. Uh, however... Bishop had some resignations about this. Up until this point, he had been basically the de facto leader, and he kind of demurred a bit and hesitated, um, and he initially said on September 25th, yeah, sure, I'll go for that plan, I'll have joint leadership, but then uh, later he was like, actually, no, I won't do this. Uh, so kind of a conflict quickly developed, um, and in October, this really came to a head, and some of the party put Bishop under house arrest for his just adamant refusal to give up power, basically. It's uncertain whether or not he was, you know, becoming a bit power mad or if he genuinely thought that Coward couldn't do the job. Uh, here's where some uncertainty starts to develop, and we kind of have and to speculate. And that's probably never going to be yeah. resolved. Um, but around this time, too, Bishop kind of, it's unclear if Bishop spread this rumor, but rumors begin to circulate that Coward, Bernard Coward and Phyllis Coward, the Cowards were planning and plotting for Bishop's death and overthrow so they could become just the single leaders of the party. Uh, so it's unclear if Bishop spread this rumor, but some people did believe that he spread this rumor, um, including, I think, Phyllis Coward later said that she did believe that he had spread the rumor. Uh, regardless, Bishop was placed under house arrest on October 12th, uh, and the CENTCOM accused him of spreading the rumors that the Cowards were plotting his assassination, uh, with the explanation being that Bishop spread these rumors basically to consolidate his own power and get the people on his side and say, look, they're trying to overthrow your leader. Um, and... Oh, I'm sorry, that's October 13th, Bishop is placed under house arrest. October 12th is when the CENTCOM says all this and accuses him of spreading the rumors. Um, on October 14th, however, uh, Coward's resignation is read aloud on national radio over the air. Um, it's unclear if Coward actually resigned, but the story was basically that Coward wasn't going to be in power if Bishop wasn't also. Although they had political disagreements, uh, Bishop... If Bishop wasn't going to be there, then Coward was also not going to be there, so he supposedly resigned. Uh, again, we're speculating here because some of this becomes really unclear, and there's not actually a lot written about this. And it's it kind of ideological. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind here, too, that Coward and Bishop had been basically boyhood friends. so it's Close political yeah. allies and friends their entire lives. Yeah. So it makes sense that if you know one of your best friends leaves the government, maybe you will want to leave it, too. So perhaps Coward really did resign on October 14th. Um, a few days later, on October 17th, Hudson Austin, commander of the armed forces and the defense minister, uh, says that there has been a military – said that there has not technically been a military coup, but that Bishop has been temporarily deposed. 
Uh, so he denies that there's been a military coup because basically now the armed forces are the executive of the island and kind of running things. But he does say that Bishop has been deposed. Mm -hmm. uh, two days later, uh, October 19th, very early in the morning, mass crowds basically come to Bishop's rescue and free him from house arrest. Uh, and actually, it's kind of funny, but they shouted, uh, quote, we coming back for you all to the cowards who lived only a few doors away from Bishop's house. Uh, and so Bishop basically uh, immediately wakes up from his house arrest and goes to the military base, Fort Rupert, to try and talk with Austin, Hudson Austin, and see what's going on, and also to try and free some loyal people in the military because he heard that they've been imprisoned by Austin. Right, and this is basically a question in the, in the, of who in the rank and file of the People's Revolutionary Army is loyal to, Austin or who's loyal to bishops? So. Yeah, uh, but Bishop arrives at the fort, and confusion and chaos kind of quickly erupts, actually, because the crowds follow him there, and they're concerned about their leader, Bishop, um, and they kind of storm the fort a bit, and here it becomes really unclear what exactly happened, but uh, Bishop and his followers, his, a few of his cabinet ministers, basically get trapped in the tiny room at the fort when basically they hear gunfire erupting outside. Um, and we actually have a first-hand account of what happened here. Uh, this is from Nancy Liu, who was with Maurice Bishop and Jacqueline Kraft in their last hour. Uh, and this is, again, from that paper I quoted from earlier. But she says, quote, I was making cups of coffee. I gave the first to Maurice, but he said, quote, give it to St. Paul. Matron Grant, Senator, Norris Bain's wife, Marcel Belmar's mother, Merle Hodge, Chris, Stur Chris Strude, Porgy Cherubim, Avis, and Jackie were in the room. I uh, apologize to anybody if I mispronounce these names. Jackie said, I don't like this. I'm scared. I know these guys go do something stupid. Ava said, I never see so much people in one place. Then there was a loud explosion. Something pushed me against a wall, physically lifted me. When I look, Avis was totally dismantled. There were fatty tissues floating in blood and body fluid. Where I was, heavy gunfire was hitting the wall. If I got up to run, I would get hit. I decided to stay right there. Matron Grant was praying, quote, Stop the hands of the slaughterers, Jesus. Maurice said, See where the firing is coming from. I lost it. I said to myself, If I have to die, let me die with no pain. I was about to stand up. Senator threw himself at me and locked my neck. Porgy said, I will try to see if there's anything I could do. He called out, Longanya, hold your fire. There are many injured people in there. We heard the reply, Drop your effing guns and come out with your hands in the air. Porgy said, there is no one with guns in here. The threat was repeated. Maurice said, let the women and children go to the protesters outside. Uh, quote, I was covered in blood. I could not lift my right hand. A bullet had hit me. I felt like sticks were poking me in my side. Jackie Kraft held on to my pants what was left of the jeans. Uh, Gemma Belmar was still breathing, even though there was a bullet straight through her head. Vincent Noel was lying in the veranda. He said, Sister Anne, help me, help me. I proceeded to go down the steps. Jackie held on to my sleeve. Someone said, look at Jackie Kraft. Don't let the mother effers get away. I got to the hospital gate. So it's really, uh, this end quote, is really a very dramatic and traumatic event that happened there. And events become really unclear. Um, Maurice Bishop and uh, three or four of his followers basically, basically are captured by military forces under the command of Hudson and are executed later that day. Uh, a, few, Phyllis, a few union leaders as yeah. well, and many civilians yeah. who happened to be there, who were bishop supporters that had gone to his house mm -hmm. with him initially and had joined him on the march to Fort Rupert. Mm -hmm. And lots of government ministers are also uh, in prison, which leads us to believe that perhaps the Coward didn't organize this because Phyllis Coward was one of those who was imprisoned that same day. You'd think if you know the Coward had organized this, that one of them wouldn't be in jail. Uh, but it becomes kind of unclear. But Grant and I think that the Coward's probably didn't do it, which is a standard story, but that maybe especially given that Coward and Bishop had been friends since childhood and that later on all the members of the party who were talking about it said that they didn't think Bishop deserved to die at all, even that they had disagreements with them. Obviously, this is a horrible thing to happen. They didn't want it to happen. Uh, but it did happen, and it's pretext for the American invasion. This was basically used as the excuse for the American invasion. Now, it wasn't the reason for the American invasion. This had, been in, this had probably been in planning months mm -hmm. before. Even the... Um, even the uh, ambassador to France, he said on French national television right after the invasion happened, you know, that basically before the coup against Bishop ever even happened, that the U.S. had been planning this invasion. You know, we have members of, you know, people appointed directly by Reagan saying this. Uh, There's also the CIA implications in the bombing in 1980. This had been planning for a while, and the U.S. is just looking for a reason, and they decided to use the coup against Bishop mm -hmm. as the reason. Um, now... Reagan invaded in what was called Operation Urgent Fury with 7,000 American troops and a few hundred troops from uh, a few different uh, Caribbean island nations. I believe yeah, Barbados, on, uh, yeah. Dominica, St. Kitts, I believe. They were, they were called on to join. 
Um, so they airlifted basically a bunch of troops onto the uh, onto the airport that was still under construction by this time. They had Cuban construction workers working at this airport that see American troops parachuting of the 82nd Airborne Division parachuting. And there's a firefight between Cuban construction workers who were armed and American troops. And a lot of Cubans and a few Americans die. Yeah. And basically, they take a bunch of other Cubans construction workers as prisoners of war. And what they did next was really, this violates international law in the Geneva Protocols. They forced Cuban construction workers to march ahead of American military vehicles into the firefight. These were unarmed, unarmed people that were just working on the airport. Yeah, now prisoners of war, yeah. And they were put right in the middle of the firefight. And so, um, basically in the next few days, uh, the People's Revolutionary Army was mostly... Um, evacuated out of the St. George's area and the major towns. Some were in the, uh, the like, jungles yeah. of, the in, of the inner part of the country, the very rural parts, and the U.S. would stay over two months to uh, basically yeah. wait for them to all come out. During this time, they initiated a witch hunt against all the prominent members of New Jewel, yeah. all, the big, all their biggest supporters. Basically didn't stand a chance against the world's biggest superpower. Exactly, exactly. It was such Horrible. a one-sided engagement. Yeah. And also... Cubans um, had to be returned to Cuba, and there were like many Cubans that were killed. Almost a hundred Cubans died in this invasion. A lot of them were not even members of the Cuban military. Mm. They were doctors, they were construction workers, etc. They were professionals. Now, Reagan claimed for the invasion of Grenada that the new airport was being constructed as an installation, a military installation for Soviet and Cuban forces. Now, the airport was actually built as to international regulation specification. And the British multinational company that ran the construction said it was a civilian airport. Reagan claimed that the 10,000-foot runway that they were making was only for military use. However, under international uh, aviation regulations, you need at least 9,800 feet on a runway to, for the airport to meet, meet standards, to be up to snuff. It was built yeah. as a tourist, uh, it was built as a civilian airport, most, mostly for tourism, yeah, which they were trying to develop. Yeah, for small commuter planes, right? Yeah. yeah. Not for large military planes. Re uh, Reagan said in his ad in, um, to an address in an address that Grenada is quote a Soviet and Cuban colony. He said that on October 28th. This implies that Grenada was not an independent government under the New Jewel. Here's the facts: the Soviets didn't recognize and pursue relations with Grenada until uh, under the New Jewel movement until six months after the revolution. And a declassified report from the Grenadian embassy in Moscow from July of 1983 reveals that actually Soviet and Grenadian relations were often weak and tenuous. Yeah. Richard Jacobs, the Grenadian ambassador to uh, 11 socialist countries, only learned of Bishop's visit to the U.S. in May and June to try and meet with Reagan from the radio media in East Germany, Voice of America, which was Western propaganda that they blasted um, into the Eastern Bloc countries. Countries. He learned it over the radio. The, his ambassador to the USSR didn't even know. <laughs> Jacobs was the simultaneous ambassador to 11 socialist countries. He was a very busy guy. He should have known if they were you know, being puffeted by the Soviets or something. Absolutely. Or, yeah. or if he was making such a big visit. So the Soviets didn't even know that Bishop was in the U.S. So how controlling could they have really been? Bishop's visit was also, like we said, shrugged off by Reagan, who refused to meet with him, or even send someone to meet with him. Additionally, one month after the 1979 re um, revolution, Bishop went on a national radio and said that the Grenada was going to be a non-aligned country. He said, quote, Grenada is a sovereign and, and independent country, although a tiny speck on the world map, and we expect all countries to strictly respect our independences just as we will respect theirs. No country has the right to tell us what to do or how to run our country and who, who to be friendly with. He said in 1979, like later, in that, that's what that, in that speech, which is called In Nobody's Backyard. Additionally, he said, we pursue a foreign policy of non-alignment in 1983. He said this uh, in Washington uh, at, at a meeting of the Organization of American States. Reagan also claimed that uh, Bishop, the coup against Bishop was engineered by Cuba. In reality, Fidel Castro was one of Bishop's biggest allies, yeah, absolutely. and he was one of the first to condemn the coup. In fact, there was a national day of mourning in Cuba after Bishop was killed. Cuba had numerous civilian construction workers in the country, and soldiers, and educators. Why wouldn't they recall them first? Additionally, Cuba notified the U.S. on October 22nd that it is ready, quote, to cooperate in the solution of problems without violence or intervention, three days before the invasion. The U.S. did not reply to that Cuban proposal. Additionally, the U.N. General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to condemn the invasion. 108 to 9 was the vote. The U.S. Violation, U.S. invasion violated the U.N. Charter, international law, and the Geneva Conventions. Yeah. The Security Council also voted to condemn it, right? All 14 out of the 15 nations, except the U.S., voted on a resolution to condemn it, which basically would have given them uh, further 
permission too to maybe pursue sanctions against the U.S. for this right. unlawful it intervention. Was, it was so universally despised. Yeah, it's crazy. So this totally illegitimate intervention in the U.S. by Reagan, chief douchebag in chief of the United States foreign policy. So and here's a few quotes from some of the American troops that were in Grenada. Um, the Cuban ambassador's home was damaged and looted by American soldiers. On one wall was written AA, symbol of the 82nd Airborne Division. And beside it was the message, and I'm sorry for this, but this is a direct quote, Eat shit, commie faggot. Captured Cubans were used as hostages in order to march in front of American jeeps as they advanced, like I said. Violation of the Geneva Convention. And one American troop actually said, I want to fuck communism out of this little island and F it right back to Moscow. I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> Direct quote. So this is a brutal invasion, and 400 Grenadians died. Some Americans died. Almost 100 Cubans died. Mm -hmm. And for what? This country that in no way was a threat yeah. to the United States. It was one of the least threatening countries to any country on the planet. So that's what the Reagan administration and what the U.S. has stood for, being a bully to world to countries worldwide since its founding, basically, is that if you, especially in the U.S., quote, backyard, if you dare to make a progressive social, socialist government that, you know, raises people up from the horrible poverty of neoliberalism, 